how many properties do you guys own? 290-ish. Now we're sitting at about 47 million in, in real estate owned. Uh, we buy and sell about 250, 300 houses a year. I don't want to give our listeners the impression that, oh, well, he's got the money now. Of course, it's easy, right? We're only talking about a nine-year journey here. This is a testament to the you know 500,000 followers you have. Is you're just an ordinary guy. Anybody can do this. The Burr's method is a way to buy real estate creatively where you don't have to use any of your own cash. It allows you to scale very quickly because even if you have a decent amount of cash, it gets eaten up very quickly if you leave it in deals. It stands for buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and scale. Hello, podcast community. This is the Investing Twin Podcast. I'm your host, Garrett. And I am very honored to have Sam Prim in the flesh, so to speak, in our virtual recording studio. Sam, how are you today? I'm doing well, man. I'm excited to chop it up and have a little fun and, and, and spit some good, good information. I want to first congratulate you just passing this 500,000K followers on Instagram. Like, just congratulations. That is just crazy milestone. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. It's been a lot. I focused on TikTok for a while because that was like the biggest growth one. But then uh, I, I saw quickly that Instagram was kind of where I wanted to grow. So I focused on that for about the last year and really got some momentum. So I appreciate it. All that hard work is is paying off. Well, that's good to know for someone who's fledgling and just starting out like me, there, there's hope. <laughs> but uh, I feel like you're a lot more dynamic than me. Maybe we can talk off camera. But um, in all seriousness, um, let's do sort of a, I want to do a, a very light intro for you because I really want to talk about your story and, and how you got into it. But why don't you sort of give the particulars to the audience? Yeah, so my story, I'll, I'll kind of cover it pretty quickly and we can deep dive wherever you want to deep dive. But my story is very, very um, bland and not exciting. So I think that's a good thing. I used to shy away from that. But I grew up in the Midwest in the lower middle class, didn't want for anything, but didn't have a ton, if that makes sense. Um, traditional household, dad worked for one company for 40 years, engineer, mom was a part-time teacher, um, all that kind of stuff. So nothing, nothing crazy fancy there and was on that path of working for a company for 40 years, just like I saw and was raised around. Uh, so I graduated college and got a job at a great company and was doing that for a couple of years. And, and during that beginning phases of that, I was getting promotions and doing well, but I just wanted more. I wanted more control and I didn't know exactly what that looked like, but I started to realize I didn't want to do this forever. So I mean, a buddy started to invest in real estate in the side in 2014. We're able to build up enough that we quit our jobs in 2018 um, and then have been full time since then. So uh, now we're sitting at about 47 million in, in real estate owned. Uh, we buy and sell about 250, 300 houses a year. Um, and then we have a property management company that manages our properties. And then we also I, I do some online education stuff and branding. So kind of a lot, but if it's just in real estate now and it's my full time gig. So I'm enjoying it. I love it. Um, as my, my listeners know, um, I started off in the science, um, after, right after graduate school. And I think there's a lot of applications that we can all speak about with our, our current lives. Do you feel like anything in your, your corporate job still kind of, is that foundation for what you are today? Or is it just kind of just set and forget it? No, I think there are some things that are applicable. I mean, I think you can be super successful without the corporate experience, but I think like anything else you learn and take certain nuances and certain bits and pieces from there. What what kind of I got from my corporate job was a couple of things. One of them was structure. I was in sales at first and ended up being sales manager, so still kind of in sales, but I noticed that I was able to do a lot more than everybody else because I had a set structure and I did the same thing over and over again. And, and, and I never thought I was too good to do any certain thing where a lot of people, they get a few sales or do this or that, and then they kind of lay, lay their foot off the gas. So I learned that if I do the same thing over and over again and be consistent, it's going to lead to results. And that has definitely shown itself through social media and all the other things I've done. And then also I got confidence because when I started that job, I didn't know what the quote unquote real world was. It was my first job just out of college, 2011, the market, you know, the whole economy was kind of all over the place. And I was able to like build a base customer base and, and get promoted and then get promoted again and was able to kind of work my way up pretty quickly around a lot of other people that were a lot older than me. I was, you know, going past and end up managing. So it just gave me the confidence that if I did 
what I just talked about. Same thing over and over again was consistent and continued to push and had some system behind it. Um, I could really separate myself. So I kind of took those two things and, and molded them into my current businesses. But other than that, uh, not a ton from the corporate uh, selling Caterpillar construction equipment. No, for sure. If you could name one skill, though, that uh, I mean, I guess you were in what sales sort of. Or, mm -hmm. OK, do you do you use any of those skills uh, in your real estate business? Yeah, I think I think to a certain degree, especially when like I'm dealing with we're trying to buy a house. I don't do as much on the single houses anymore, but like an apartment complex or a package of houses. I learned a lot about like negotiation and, you know, being able to, you know, whatever, not be the first one to, to say the number or to, you know, look beyond just the numbers and try to develop a relationship and try to bring other things to the table. I actually just shot a video on this when I was looking to buy houses at first. I would focus on the price. Mr. and Mrs. House Seller, here's the price. Here's why it's the price. It was price, price, price. So I only gave them one, one deciding factor was the price. But when I focused on what I could do for them, the solutions of letting you stay in the house longer, giving you some money up front, letting you come back to the house after the fact, leaving the house exactly as it is, I gave them multiple reasons to pick me over everybody else that was just talking about price. So I gave them more reasons to go with me than just the price. And a lot of times when I started to get the house buys, and I wasn't even the highest bidder because I did those other things. So those are the kind of skills that um, I learned in, you know, uh, selling equipment. And it took me a while to figure out how to parlay that to actually the real estate side. So it didn't happen right away. But then I, I started to go, go back and what made me successful at the other, you know, doing the other stuff and try to pull some of those same traits. Awesome. No, I, I will be going into a deep dive. Uh, tons of stuff here. I don't want to just talk about properties necessarily because, uh, I think everybody sees you talking about that stuff. I kind of want to dive into Sam, Sam the man. So 2014 to 2018. So walk me backwards. It's 2014. And I remember this sitting in my job and going, man, I just, it's got to be a better way. We all say that. What was the light bulb? Like why real estate? Yeah. And it's, it's again, my whole upbringing, everything's super cliche, but in 2012, my business partner now and best friend then and now um, gave me rich dad, poor dad. Right. So I read that in my honeymoon in 2012. So started to turn my mind around of like, if I want to do more and take more control, real estate creates most millionaires, low barrier of entry. Kiyosaki kind of showed me the difference assets, like, like just kind of opened my mind a little bit. And I honestly, don't remember that much specifically from the book. It just kind of pointed me in the direction of real estate. So that's what, um, you know, it took us a couple of years of talking back and forth, but that's when, uh, that's what kind of was the linchpin that, that pushed me to say, Hey, I don't know how to develop an app. I'm not a coder. I'm not a software engineer. Like what kind of business can we start on the side? Why would they have a full-time job? And to me, the only answer for my skill set was real estate. So it wasn't like, oh, I got all these options to make myself wealthy. What can I do? It's like, this is the only path if you're going to make it work. So that, that kind of was like almost through attrition more than anything. 100%. 100%. Um, you know, I, I did a, a, a post a couple months ago. You never forget your first. And what uh, what I refer to, of course, is our first rental property. So tell me about that. Your first rental property, all the mistakes. Uh, I want to hear everything. Yeah. So I wanted to buy rental properties. My initial goal was to replace my W-2 income with rental properties. That's not what I would suggest anyone doing, especially if you do it the way I do it with using none of your own money. So like if the cash flow is not super heavy, but you're buying the asset. So you got to figure out what you want. But anyways, so my goal is to buy rental properties. And at the time, I didn't have enough money to put 20% down on a rental property. I thought you had to put 20% down cash. I was like, I don't have the cash. But if I flip a house and use that profit to put 20% down, then I will get the 20% down. So that's what I did. I, I bought a house. I knew you could borrow money to buy houses. It took me about six months uh, to find a private lender. Um, so I, I found a private lender. I saw flip or flop HG, HGTV shows, you know, where they borrow money from a rich friend or whatever and, and flip a house and split the profit. So that's what I was planning to do was, you know, buy a house um, and, and, and flip it. And I looked at, I, I just ran the math and looked at the numbers. So we looked at 35 houses uh, before we bought our first one. We had, uh, you know, six, six months until we got our first private lender. Um, and we had 22 banks tell us no. So that earlier I was talking about doing the same thing over and over again and eventually getting it. That's kind of where that tied into a little bit. But regardless, we got the property under contract. We bought it. 
We were fixing it up. And I, when I say we, it's my business partner, Lucas. So we were doing everything we could, uh, you know, tearing out the cabinets, painting, um, you know, uh, ripping off the deck out back, doing landscaping, doing what we could and hiring out the rest. And uh, we ended up throughout that process learning about the Burrs method and the cash out refinances. And we're like, oh, this one might make sense. Maybe we don't have to sell this one. Maybe we can just use that 20 percent equity we're creating rather than cash it out on another one. We can just use that uh, to a, at a bank to actually keep this one. And that's what we ended up doing. So we ended up getting it appraised. It was it was enough to get our private lender paid back plus interest. And we ended up keeping that property and I still own it today. So that really opened our eyes with holy crap. We own a rental property. It's cash flowing 250 bucks a month, nothing crazy, but we own it. It's ours and we didn't have to use any of our own money. Let's go do that again and again and again until we can replace our W2 income. And we'll get into that, but that that's that's pretty tough to do. We had to do some other things. But anyways, it was just one of those things where um, it just really showed the power of just taking action and figuring it out as you go. Because I didn't even know about the Burrs method when, when I bought it. Well, I think everybody, again, HGTV, it's all about flipping, right? And depending where you are, and I know in California, you see them making three, 400,000 on a flip with just a paint job, but that's not reality, right? Um, I've done some flips, obviously. I find it fascinating that you started thinking you're going to flip and then you turn that into your very first burr. Um, would you say that classify your, yourself as a burr specialist or do you, do you think you're now multifaceted? Um, I would, I would say my focus is the burrs. You know, we, I've wholesaled and flipped or my company that uh, over a thousand houses in the past eight years. So a ton of wholesales and a decent amount of flips in there. You know, um, I've done apartment complexes, self storage, so I've, a, a hotel. So I've kind of done a lot of everything, but everything I own that I hold and own long term, I've used some version of the Burrs method. I call it the Burrs method, but I use some version of the Burrs method to buy it. So I bought apartment complexes with the Burrs a commercial building, a hotel, and over 150 single family houses, all with none of my own money because of this Burrs method. So I would say, I don't know a ton of people that have utilized the Burrs more than I have and continue to utilize the Burrs like I do. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of, my debt and the Burrs method is kind of what I'm known for, so. Okay, no, I know that, well, why don't we, why don't we, um, I know that I sent you sort of a structure, but we're just going to go wherever this conversation takes us before we get too deep into it, because there are some aspiring real estate investors that are listening to this, thinking of their very first property. And they're probably also thinking flip. Why don't we, why don't we unpack what a burr is? What does it stand for? Like just go into the basics. Yeah, for sure. So uh, basically in a nutshell, the Burrs method is a way to buy real estate creatively where you don't have to use any of your own cash. Now, there's a few steps to follow I'll go through, but in the genesis of it, it allows you to scale very quickly because even if you have a decent amount of cash, it gets eaten up very quickly if you leave it in deals. So if you want to scale to any level, the Burrs method is the way to do it. It stands for buy, rehab, rent, refinance and scale. And I'll do a, a super quick and simple math version of it. So um, I'll, I'll explain it, then I'll use math to kind of drive it home. So you buy a distressed property, you rehab that distressed property, you get it rented, you turn it into a cash producing asset, and then you go to a bank and get a loan to pay back who you borrowed the money to buy it and rehab it from. And then you use the rent to pay back the bank. And then the S stands for scale if you want to do it at any level. So let's say um, there's a ton of different places to get money, either whether it be a hard money lender, a private money lender, a line of credit, um, a home equity line of credit, whatever it looks like, you borrow uh, money to buy the house. So simple math. It's a $50,000 house and it needs $25,000 in repairs. So you borrow $75,000 from a private lender. You buy the house and you repair it. Buy rehab. The next step is get it rented. Start to prove that it is a cash producing asset. Then you go to a bank. A bank will appraise the property. You have 75 grand of a private lender's money in the deal. They're going to appraise it. It appraises for $100,000 because you bought it at a discount, added value by repairing it. So the bank will give you a loan for up to 80% of that value. So the bank gives you a loan for 80 grand. That's a check. It's a loan. It's a mortgage now, but they give you the money, cash out refinance. You take that 80 grand, you pay back your private lender. They're 75 plus five grand in interest. So your private lender's paid off. That one is done. It's off the table. They made their money. They made their interest. They're happy. They want to do another one. Now you do owe the bank 80 grand, but you owe them that over the next 25, 30 years as a mortgage. And you collected rent in the third step. So you're using the rent to pay back the bank every single month. 
And if you did it all right, there's a little bit of cash flow left over. So at the end of the day, you own that property that's worth a hundred grand that has 20, that has 20 grand in equity in it. And over time, that property is going to go up in value. The tenant's going to pay down the mortgage and you're going to collect cash along the way. And it's cool. And one property can change your life, but you can do it as many times as you want. Hence the scale part. So it's kind of a, a quick version of it. But in general, you know, you're creating equity creatively um, by buying at discounts and borrowing money. And you're just using other people's money to fill in the gaps. Okay. I mean, I bought my first... I think it was uh, 50 properties, 75 doors using what I'd call a, a very slow burn method because we didn't use other people's money OPM. We did everything just with my job and saving and refining. I would say that maybe the initial um, down payment was there and then obviously you can daisy chain it across. But yeah, I mean, it was very slow, which is why we only made it to 45 before I, I had a split with my ex-business partner there and obviously I expanded our management company. What would you say to somebody who, I, I mean, obviously people look at the high interest of private money, right? It is higher, obviously, than a bank. What would you say to that person who objects to that? Like, are we talking how fast are you able to pay them back? And if you can't, what are the risks of it? Yeah. So I, I tell most people that are like, oh, I don't want to pay a private lender 12%. Well, usually it's, do you have enough money to do it yourself? Do you have a, do you have that 75 grand cash in that example, which isn't even applicable anymore? You probably got to double it. So do you have 150 grand cash? 99% of people are going to say no. So do you want to pay eight, 10, 12% annualized, you know, to somebody to get a deal that creates wealth? Or do you want to just continue to sit where you're at? So it's not like, can you get it cheaper? It's your only option if you don't have the money. So I look at it as that way. Do you want the house or not? All right, we'll figure out how to make it work with that interest rate. And the, the risk involved, you know, even if you, you know, let's say this deal, for example, that $75,000 and it appraised for a hundred, let's say you had $85,000 into it and it appraised for a hundred. What you can do is just sell it. At that point, like you have options, you know, if, if it's if it's not going to be worth what you think it's going to be worth, you can sell it and break even or make a little bit of money and pay back your lender and have that lessons learned. So you have a lot of different options going down the path. Now, the end goal, hopefully, is buying those rental properties if you're using this method. But you do have a few different options. And and if you're conservative and you understand the process and you just buy at enough of a discount and you manage your rehab properly, you know, there's a there's variations for sure. But you know what you can buy it for. You can figure out what it's probably going to be worth fixed up. You can figure about how much it needs, you know, in repairs. Of course, there's some variances, but it's not like we're shooting blind here, right? There are some known factors with some variances around them that that aren't super crazy if you do your due diligence and if you understand the process. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, there's you, you mentioned a lot of variables there in terms of contractors and hidden defects. Maybe you walk through a property, didn't realize that the foundation was cracked, but I think I mean, I've had this experience too. At the very end of the day, like you said, you can still rent it out at a, a slight loss or you could sell it. I think, and I was just meeting with a client this morning in my management company side because they're like, oh, interest rates have now, at least here in Canada, gone up from 2% up to 7%. I'm not cash flowing anymore. I said, okay, well, let's look at the numbers, right? It's got a $700,000 property that's increasing. I think he admitted conservatively hundred grand in like three or four years. So 25 grand a year. I'm like, okay, if you were to take 20% of 700,000, 140,000, and you do the math that you're getting $25,000 every single year. And that's, we're not even talking about principal pay down or any of the tax benefits. I think we calculated was like 26 or 27% ROI. Where are you going to be able to get that other than real estate? And while I'm not going to pretend it's a sure thing. To me, at least, it's a heck of a lot more sure than me putting it into stocks or bonds or whatever else is out there, right? Yeah. I mean, to me, a sure thing, I'd, I don't like absolutes. And it sounds like you're similar, like it's 100% guaranteed. But 
historically it is guaranteed real estate doubles in value every 15 years. And I'm talking some more like the stats. These are more U S stats. Sure. So in the yeah. U S real estate's doubled in value every 15 years since 1950. Um, and sometimes it's done a lot more than that. So of course there's variables and it goes up and down, but if you're worried about what your property is going to be worth in the next six to 12 months or, or 24 months, then you shouldn't be investing in real estate. Like that's what you should do for stocks. If you're worried about little variations in short period of time, you know, dips or, or, or rises, then real estate's probably not for you, at least owning real estate. You have to look at the long-term picture and real estate does go up in value in aggregate. It has to because inflation, whilst I've been a lot recently, it's always going to be there. There's always going to be some level of inflation. Therefore, the brass tax, it can't be built for cheaper than it was built today. So in 10 years, 15 years, no matter really what the market has done, it's going to eventually go up because you're not going to be able to buy that roofing and that and that concrete and that flooring and those shingles and those windows for any less than you're buying it now. Therefore, if the replacement cost is higher, the cost of what's already out there is going to be higher. So a lot of factors go into that. But if you manage your property decently and have a property management company like yours, it's going to go up in value. And if you don't ever have to sell it, it doesn't matter. Like you don't lose money owning stocks if it dips 5% this month and is up, you know, 5% next month. And if it, as long as you're not selling it, honestly, the value doesn't really matter. Maybe on your, you know, maybe telling your buddies at the bar, you know, I got this much net worth in my real estate. Maybe, you know, you have to fudge those numbers. But in general, the value does not matter if you're not looking to sell it or refinance it. So don't worry about the value because when you look back over a few years, it's going to go up and it's going to have gone up a lot. It's funny. Uh, my dad always used to say, especially when I was starting out real estate, well, it's only worth what somebody's going to pay for it when you sell it, which is absolutely true. But uh, to my example with that client I was speaking with this morning, I mean, I think he's two or three hundred dollars negative, which is I mean, nobody wants to go into a rental and have to shell out 300 bucks out of their pocket. However, where can you put three hundred dollars for all? a virtual almost guarantee that you're going to get back 25 grand every year for $300 a month. I take that deal, although I wouldn't want to do it for my entire portfolio. That's not what the purpose is, but it's a great backup plan in a high interest rate environment that we have right now. Yeah. And you didn't even, men and you, you briefly mentioned just the we're talking just growth here. We're not talking about debt pay down. The, the mortgage is probably getting paid down more than 300 a month or around that. Maybe I don't know this mortgage payment, but probably it's a break even. Then you're basically, you know, what you're paying in is getting completely picked back up with the principal pay down or what, you know, with the tenant or whatever, the combination of the two is paying that down. And then the tax benefits, you know, I know Canada's very similar. I have, I have several students up in Canada. You know, the main difference is your guys' banking system, your five main banks are a little bit different, but in general, it's similar as well. And I don't know the taxes quite as much up there, but you know, especially down here, like you get so many tax benefits for investing in real estate. It's, it's not even, it's not even talked about a ton, but they're like, I did pretty well in, in 2022 and just finished my 20 or I haven't done my 2023 taxes finalized, but I paid $0 in taxes because of all. And that's talking like from my other businesses, all the way down to the bottom because of the depreciation, because of, you know, the, 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 whatever the write-offs and all of the other benefits. So yeah, it's, there's so many different benefits and so many different um, positive levers to pull when it comes to real estate that it's, it's, you know, it's the best investment out there. You know, with stocks, you have two levers, you either sell it or you keep it. And if you keep it, you can't do anything with the money. Um, and if you sell it, you had to pay taxes in real estate. You can, it's like, get the cash flow. So you get the debit in, but you didn't pull down any of your equity in the property because it's just cash flow. So it just kind of hits the best of both of, of everything. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. You know, you, how, okay. So say the stats again, how many properties do you guys own? Um, I don't know the exact number is maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. Like 290 ish. <laughs> um, so I, I focus most of my time on the education branding side. Um, I, you know, I get told when we added a rental that week, which is kind of nice. You know, yeah. I, I get involved in like, we bought a 42 pack of houses. Um, I negotiated that. We buy apartment complexes, hotels, things like that. The bigger stuff, I kind of come in and negotiate, but I uh, got to the point in our businesses, Lucas and I were, we insert ourselves where we're needed and we hire out people that are much better than us. So I'm not the best rehab manager. I'm not the best property manager. So I have people that do that. So anyways, around 290s. I don't think it's 300 yet, so I don't want to over, over exaggerate, but around 290. Are you inspired? $47 million in real estate purchased in only nine years using none of Sam's own money. It tells you that yes, you can do this too. 
Sorry to interrupt, but if you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, this would be an entire commercial. But because you're watching on YouTube, I'm trying to make it commercial free, except for this one small favor I'd like to ask of you. I want to put this video and channel in front of as many people as possible so they can hear Sam's story. And the only way to do that is to have more subs. With more subscribers, YouTube will put this in front of other aspiring real estate investors. So please, if you like what you're watching, hit that subscribe button right down there. And let's get back to the show. No, that's fair. I mean, I was checking out online and I think at that time it was like 43 million. And then I read a few days ago, it was 45 and now you're saying 46. But what I want to do is kind of back up because I don't want to give our listeners the impression that, oh, well, he's got the money now. Of course, it's easy, right? We're only talking about a nine-year journey here. Um, so let's talk about the first five. Um, sort of in your experience, how how it kind of went, because I think most people have two or three properties and, and they kind of stay there, or let's call it five. So can you kind of describe after that first yeah, so the, the next steps were to, to add more rentals, and, and that's exactly what we did. And I, you made a great point that I want to, don't let me forget, just talking about, you know, how this stuff takes time and, you know, simple and easy are different. You and I make it sound simple, but that doesn't mean it's easy. Those those are different words. People think they're synonyms and, and they're not. But in general, our plan was to um, continue to buy those rentals to replace our W-2 income, which I said didn't really work. So we bought that first property in 2014. That was it. We were financed in 2015. In 2015, we probably bought five or six more, which I, I understand is a lot, but this is a slow rolling boulder we're talking about here. It's not like I take 46 million and divide it by eight or nine. That's not how it worked. 90% of it's been backloaded in the past three or four years because of all the work we put in, in the prior five or six. So our plan was to continue to, to add more rentals and quickly after we got up to maybe 10, let's say, um, by 2015, 16, we're like, Cash flow on our right, but man, we're going to have to buy a lot more. So that's when we um, started to look, probably should have realized it before, but we're not always the sharpest tools in the shed, um, that like you need other sources of active income. We have our W-2 jobs. We're looking at distressed property, so let's maximize every distressed property. So then we got into flipping and wholesaling, and then we were focusing on finding deals one avenue, we weren't stretching ourselves thin. And if it was a rental, great. If it was a flip, great. If it was a wholesale, great. So then we started to insert some more um, active income. Uh, and that's when we're like, okay, I see the light in the tunnel now. Let's create and grow a flipping and wholesaling business for our active income. We'll pick off rentals as we go. And that allows us to go from spending 10 hours a week on real estate and still doing well to being able to spend 60, 70 hours a week on real estate and really put the pedal to the metal and see where things go. So that was kind of how that worked. And then just, and we can dig into this next part if you want a little bit or that, but in general, most of the stuff has happened in the past few years. Like I did a video on a $5 million apartment complex and I raised a million dollars for it. And you know, I get the comments of nobody's just going to give me a million dollars. Well, of course they're not because you didn't do one deal at 100,000, which was my first deal. And then another deal at 125. Then what like we built up equity with multiple private lenders over several years. We're talking, we built up equity with local, small local banks where we had, you know, millions of dollars of loans. So we had proven ourselves. We had everything lined up to do it again with the 42 pack of houses we bought, you know, you get the naysayers saying they couldn't do it. Well, yeah, because you have to start with step one and then step two and then stumble and fall on your face, then go back to step one, then step two, then step three, then stumble again. So you have to get through it and get the momentum going. So all of this big stuff I've done has been mainly recently because of all the things we put into place and do what I said earlier, do the same thing over and over again and continue to push yourself. So we bought like $25 million worth of real estate in like an 18 month period because of all the work we put in prior. So anyways, might've took that not where you wanting to, but that was important to me. You kind of hit that light bulb in my head that it, it, this stuff takes time. No, uh, you know, it's momentum, right? And I think what I'm trying to paint as a picture here of you, and and I think this is a testament to the, you know, 500,000 followers you have, is you're just an ordinary guy. Anybody can do this. It's always possible. And that's probably why you're giving back through the, the teaching and coaching, because did I hear you correctly? Like you bought that first property and you didn't buy another one for like 18 or six, over a year anyways? 
So no, so we bought that first one 2014, but it took so long that we didn't do the refinance until 2015. You know what I mean? So it was the uh, BRRRRS method. There was six, seven month BRRRR process that should have been too sure. much, right? So it was just a yep. lot and finding the right bank. We went to refinance. And as I said earlier, 22 banks told us no. Um, part of it, because we went to like a uh, Bank of America, they now do that kind of stuff. We didn't know what we were doing, right? We went to these big banks that don't do this. And we learned and talked to the right people and finally got a, a small local bank, that the community banks that do it down here in the States. That's a big difference is our, our community and our regional banking system. But yeah, no, that first one took, you know, several months. And then, you know, that next one. And then we said just it was a slow rolling thing. So, you know, it took us a while to, to can get the momentum to be able to do multiple at a time. Let's... Um... Let's take a segue into private lending for a minute because that's the voodoo, right? I mean, I, I just told you that I did, you know, 75 units in burrs, mainly single family with all of my own money. And that took me, I mean, that's over like 15 years, right? Again, not to say that 75 is, is a small number. It's not, it's, it's not but to me, number. if I could go back, <laughs> talk to my 27 year old self, cause I was 27 when I started. I would do things so much differently, right? Collapse time because I could be so much further, not that I regret where I am. So speak to me about private lending, not the basics. I think everybody knows that you're going to be paying somebody, but the relationships and the confidence that you need to give and show your private lenders in order for them to want to work with you. I think that's where a lot of investors go wrong. They think that they need to sell themselves to an investor. And I found that I'll have a waiting list of capital investors because they know that this is a steady machine that's going to keep giving and giving. And they and I can promise them that I'm going to turn around their money on a very consistent basis. Would you agree with that? A hundred percent. And you hit on something, you know, that you learned that most people don't know, and that's just the power of leverage. So we can get into that later. But in general, I think most people, this voodoo of private lenders is because most people, and, and I do want to get foundational, but probably in a different place than you're thinking. Most people don't know what a true private lender is. Most people think private lenders are a rich parent or somebody with $10 million in the bank. And they go through their phone or their Facebook friends and they say, I don't know anybody that has $10 million in the bank, so I don't know a private lender. Every single person listening to this right now, I can confidently say, even though I just went back on my words of speaking in, in, in you know, absolutes, but every single person knows somebody or knows somebody that knows somebody that's a private lender because private lenders. Are, are they're you? They're besides your business acumen. They're people, you know, you know, in their early forties. Um, they're people in their fifties. They're W two corporate employees. What you used to be that have some extra money. They have equity in their house. They've lived in the same house for twenty years. Their kids are in high school. They have equity in their house. They have an IRA that they've been contributing to for the last fifteen years that they can self direct and lend out at tax deferred rates. They have a four hundred one k that they can borrow against. They have some type of money market account that they can pull money from without having to pay a ton of fees. It's just somebody, an everyday person. It's an insurance agent. It's an engineer. It's a sales manager. It's a police officer. It's an everyday person that has chosen the traditional route of investing. And you have to get to know them and you have to convince them and you have to let them see that they can get a guaranteed, basically, double-digit return investing in you. Like you said earlier, you're like, how do I get these people? It's like, no, how do they come to me? Because it's a win-win, but it's something that they should be coming to me for. I'm not doing, they're not doing me a favor lending me money. I'm giving them a guaranteed, personally guaranteed 12% return on their money. So I'm doing them a favor, if anything. So you don't want to really approach them that aggressively. But you get my point is, you don't have to beg for the money. You're giving them something they cannot get elsewhere. When we, when we borrow from private lenders, we personally guarantee it. We get a promissory note signed. We put them as an additional insured on the policy, and we allow them to place a lien or on the deed if they want. Most of them don't care about that anymore. But you're giving them a secure double-digit return that they're not going to get anywhere else. So in general, I, I, I wanted to go to the basics a little bit, and then we can unpack that. But private lenders are not who most people think they are. If somebody has $10 million in the bank, Garrett, they aren't giving you... 80 grand for a house, 200 grand for a house. They got $10 million in the bank. They got hundreds of millions elsewhere and they're making way more than they're worried about. So, Yeah, I, I think what we're touching on and, and diving into is really important. Um, like I said, my, my journey with private lending is only a couple of years old. Um, I had a life scare. I decided I didn't want to be in property management full-time anymore. I put 
you know, an operations manager in place. And I started getting back into my first passion of that whole acquisition, the whole Burr game. But I had to learn about private lending and I first approached it, but then I kind of took a step back and said, okay, got a property management company with 20 employees, 600 doors, got the track record. Why am I not attracting capital lenders? And I think as soon as you change your stance, and of course you have to have the experience to back it up, that's when things start to change. But if you're a novice investor, and I know they're already thinking, well, that's great. I don't even have one property. How do I even convince somebody to take a chance on me? What would you say to that? Well, I would say you're, where they are is exactly where you were and exactly where I am. By definition, you don't get experience without actually experiencing it. So every single person started out with, hey, how do I raise money for this? Or how do I raise money for that? Whether it be a business or real estate. So just knowing that you're right where other successful people have been should be somewhat encouraging to you. You're on that same path. You're not in some weird path in the woods by yourself, kind of running blind, right? You're on the exact same path every other successful person and you and I were on trying to figure it out with no experience because no, by definition, you don't have it until you have it. So I would tell them is the best thing to do is to just, um, you know, you have two options. The first easy one is try to find hard money. I, I know I don't, you know, hard money is they lend money to real estate investors. You do have to have a W2 income and have, you know, a decent credit score, but they are in business to lend money to new investors. That's how they grow. So hard money, People don't know what they are. Just Google it. They're, they're, it's an option, but private money should be where you go. But if you're talking to these private lenders, you just need to be professional. Have I can't tell you how many people, especially at first, the fact that we met and we had a business plan of, hey, and it, it's, it was one house a year for 10 years. So it doesn't have to be what you actually do. It just needs to be professional. We had a business plan. We talked professionally. We explained the process to them. We showed them the value of real estate and we, we gave them the personal guarantee and things like that, just um, helping them get some type of comfort level because most people believe real estate's a good investment asset. They just don't have the time energy or knowledge to actually go do it. But if they can be a part of it with you and just have to write a check and collect a check, it's a pretty good place to be. And, and I always tell them, I'm not asking for your entire retirement here, right? I'm asking for a, to be a diversification leg for you so that you're diversified in your 401k, your stocks are a little bit riskier. Do you have a pension? Like I'm just trying to be one of those legs that allows them a more stable retirement because we're backed by real estate here, which is the most stable asset class overall. So that's what I kind of, my little whole spiel to them is, I'm not looking for all your money. I'm not looking to drain drain your bank account and have you give me all every dime you've ever made. I'm just looking to diversify you here and give you a little bit more options when you retire for some more income. I love it. No, that that is a, a great tip. So you were going and talking about that anybody can be a private lender. They don't have to be these you know millionaires. I mean, I know in the in the U.S. and we're up here in Canada, we have that that uh, label accredited investor. Um, I know here, obviously, you have to have a certain amount of income or combined with your spouse, a certain amount of income and or a million dollars in. I'm just throwing numbers out there because obviously these things change. I know they have the same thing in the U.S., but you're not describing an accredited investor. You're saying, especially when you say things like promissory notes, can you expand on that a little bit? Um, accredited versus private, and would you would you ever do a deal with accredited investors? For sure. And some of the investors that I have are accredited. They just don't define themselves as that. So when you're talking accredited investor, I think the numbers you said were, they've changed a little bit, but yeah, million dollar net worth, 200 grand um, combined income, whatever it might look like. And you can include your house. And I think not the mortgage, don't need to go down that. But I think uh, yeah, I think in general, those numbers were pretty accurate. So um, that's a lot of people these days. And I know that there's people do way less, but that's a lot of different people. And most of my private lenders probably are accredited, but people take that accredited investor route and, and just by the, the governments that we have that, you know, kind of talk or whatever, that, um, you know, those people are financially um, responsible. So we'll allow people to poach from them and, you know, and, and like try to raise money at, at volume with accredited investors. Like you can pitch money and say, anybody raise, you know, give me your money to invest in real estate only if you're accredited. You can do that at mass because the governments just say, hey, if they have this much net worth, they're responsible with money. I can't pitch to the world, give me your money 
unless I say it's accredited. So it's more of like a mass marketing push. And the way I go, it's just more relational based. If you have a relationship with that person, you they don't have to be accredited or they don't have to go through that process. If you have a relationship or some type of connection with them, a friend of a friend type of thing, you can just anybody that has some extra cash some way or somehow or has access to capital some way or somehow can be your investor. So um, it's just a kind of a unique situation. Uh, most Private lenders probably are accredited, but that's more of just mass marketing to, to raise funds. For sure. But if they're not accredited, there's different rules that apply, right? At least up here in Canada, friends and family, that's fine. But if it's a complete stranger that reaches out to me, at least, uh, I have to make sure that they're accredited or there's that whole securities and risk. Um, do you, how do you, how do you navigate those waters? Yeah. So if, if I don't know them uh, or me and my business partner don't have a relationship with them prior, we're not going to just take take their money. So everybody we've used on the uh, private lending side, we have a relationship with or we develop a relationship with, especially with the rules of like we're I mean, everybody needs to follow the rules. We're not I'm never going to tell anybody not to do that. But that's more for people that are raising, you know, millions going after if, if you're getting 80 grand, 100 grand, you're like, you'll be OK. But what I always tell people with that is, yeah, um, you know, when people reach out to me just, you know, on via social media, yeah, we, I don't need the money right now. And if I do, I will do the credit investor, um, you know, uh, fund route and, and, and start a fund. But in general, um, I just I would tell people develop a relationship with that person. If they reach out to you to give their money, I don't know the exact laws, rules, but start to get to know them a little bit and then, you know, have a relationship with them. Then I think that does help you get around a lot of it. You're right. You can't just blindly take you know money from somebody um, unless they uh, uh, have that accredited status. Yeah, I think, I mean, the government's put these rules in place because people have gotten hurt and it's really to protect the public, right? Mm -hmm. And to me, at least the way I view an accredited investor, like I mainly work with accredited investors only because I'm trying not to work with friends and family just because I've had some bad experiences in as a business principle. But accredited investors to me is just somebody who meets that criteria. I'm not looking to have a fund but the government defines that as somebody who is successful enough and has enough net worth to, to know what risks they're getting into should it go sideways. Although, again, we're talking real estate, which is almost a sure thing, assuming that the operator is competent enough, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, real estate, like you said, real estate can go sideways and it has gone sideways for people that over leverage, for market shifts that happen relatively quickly, but that stuff's pretty rare. If, if you're a good operator and you know how to buy and you know how to manage, you know how to rehab it, it's, it's, it's a pretty, pretty safe investment because you have control over it. Unlike the stocks, you don't have control over what the board does in a meeting of a company you have invested in stocks in. So when you're when you're doing it, you're like the board member, the stockholder, you're everything because you, so you have that control. So assuming the operator is good, the, the control they have should allow them to be flexible and, and make it work somehow or some way. Yeah, you know, I, I wanted to uh, segue a little bit. I, I think what we're trying to do here is paint a picture of confidence to a novice investor or experienced. And to have that good problem, as I, I know you are and I do occasionally, where you have too many lenders and too many people. And so how do you balance that in terms of you have a waiting list and you don't have enough inventory, not enough projects to go around and you have people with money in hand that would love to invest with you? How do you choose? Yeah, so that that's a tricky game we play. Fortunately, you know, we buy 250-ish houses a year. So um, we don't close on all of them, but a lot of them we do. So we have a big enough business and, and rentals as well that we're able to pretty much fill most people's money. But there are times where we just kind of got to be selective and pick and choose and, you know, keep people's biz money business for the most or keep keep people's money busy for the most part. But you're right. There is, um, you know, certain times where you'll have to kind of juggle that because if you get a private lender and treat them well, most people hang out, people like them. So they're going to tell their friends that probably are going to be willing to invest. They're going to brag about it. They're going to talk about it. They're going to try to help you by giving you a connection. So you get one or two good ones. And before you know it, that's going to balloon to five or six good ones. So I think you just have to be communicate, explain the process. I, the, where you get in trouble is when you don't tell somebody why you haven't used their money in six months or whatever. If you communicate the process, hey, I'm being fair, I'm giving everybody a chance and I'm working through the round robin style. As soon as there's a deal that meets your criteria, your dollar amount, 
we're going to contact you. So I think that's the biggest thing I'd, I'd like people to take away from that is just the more communication, the better, especially when you're dealing with people's money. Communication is everything when you're building relationships, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I thought, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that I saw a series of posts, or maybe this is just one of your philosophies, because we're we're kind of painting this Burr picture as something that's very short term. You're paying back the lender as soon as you refi. But I thought I saw some posts where you're leaving the money in the property and still paying your private lender while you're waiting for the equity and value to build up. Is that inaccurate? I thought I saw something like that. No, that's accurate. So that's like an extended burr is what we call it. And that's on our bigger project. So our apartment complex, our $5 million apartment complex, our $3 million apartment complex, the 42 pack of houses we bought. So you do that burr method that I talked about earlier. Those are for distressed single one-offs. But if you're buying an apartment complex, that's not really distressed, that maybe needs a little bit of work, that's low on rent, you can raise rents you can do the Burr method. You just have to convince a private lender to leave their money in the deal. So it's a little bit different. So for simple math, um, let's say you buy a million dollar apartment complex, you get $200,000 down payment and you get that from a private lender. So you raise 200 grand from a private lender rather than them doing it on a house, they do it on this apartment complex and you let them know, hey, we're going to pay you back in two, three, four years, all your money plus interest. And in the meantime, we'll pay you a little bit of interest. So what we would do is 200 grand from a private lender, $800,000 from the bank, over the next two or three years, we repair through cash flow if needed. We raise rents to closer to market rent. We're not going to buy it unless there's a value add opportunity. Just like I'm not going and buying a perfectly ready house from Zillow. I'm buying houses that need work. So same thing with apartments. Just apartments, the work is usually raising the rents or getting efficient with expenses. So that's what we'll do. And we'll, you know, over the next two or three years, that $1 million apartment complex will be worth $1.2 or $1.3 million because you increase the net income. And apartments are based on their values based on net income. It's not based on any comparable sales. So if I'm able to increase the net income, I'm therefore increasing the value of the asset. So then we tell our private lenders, it might be two years, might be three years, might be four years. But as soon as we hit that 1.25 million valuation, we will refinance. We'll pay you your money back plus interest. And like I said, along the way, we'll pay them, you know, interest on that 200 grand they gave us, to, depending on the deal. We, it's a little bit different every deal. But in general, it's a way for them to get some active. It's like them owning a rental. They get they get that cash flow, but then they also get their money back plus a bonus. So they want to get too much in the weeds there. But in general, it's just an extended Burr's method with a site with a little bit of a twist in that you're keeping the money in it. So I'm going to I'm going to challenge you with that for a second, because high interest rates are meant for short term money. How do you even buy a multifamily property that's going to, I mean, necessarily doesn't have to cash flow, but at least pay off all of its interest and, and your lenders when you have a private lender that's in that deal for such a long time? We don't pay them 12% annualized. Uh, we we make their whole deal with that kicker on the back end. So great point you noted out. So that's where you get flexible. If, if cash flow is really tight, we're going to pay them 4% annualized on their money. So that $200,000, 4%, they're making eight grand. We're splitting that out by the 12 months, right? So we're paying them a very small amount, uh, you know, 800, six, 700 bucks a month on that 200 grand they gave us. And then we're going to give them that 12%, right? So if it's a cash flow tight deal, we're going to pay them 4% annualized on their money. And then in two or three years, we pay them that other 8%. So we make sure there's enough equity that we give them the big kicker on the back end. But there's also been deals where cash flow has been great. So we paid them 8% cash flow. We're giving them a 4% kicker. So we try to get them to that 12%. But that's a beautiful thing about you know, private lenders and the flexibility that allows you, you're able to pick, you're able to kind of make each deal bend to make it work for everybody. So a great point you picked out, but yeah, you know, no, we're not paying 12% um, plus 12% on the back end. So we're just going to get them to a annualized total two, three valuation of 12% return on their money. Um, however, the deal like needs it to be. And we just communicate that no, the true, beforehand. Yeah. The true definition of a win-win, right? Yep. I mean, and I think the lesson out there is that every deal is different even though it's just a real estate deal. Every deal is specific, every deal is different. And when you're doing your underwriting on a multifam, you have to work those numbers and you have to work them hard because now the stakes are higher and you mentioned a business plan. Well, each multifamily underwriting with everybody to your lender, to the hard money lender, you have to have that business plan and that credibility. Yeah, no, you're right. It's just one of those things where you build credibility over time 
Every single person that's given us money on an apartment complex deal long term had given us money on a short term burrs deal. So we had proven the concept. We've proven the return. Um, and it just it just makes sense. And a lot of private lenders are like, yeah, that two hundred thousand dollar example, we'll get one hundred grand from one, one hundred grand from the other. Um, they'll get some active you know, money throughout the next two or three years and then they'll have enough money potentially to still do one off deals with us. So I can't believe how fast clock is running here. Um, I want to ask you one more question. Um, I I think what's interesting to me is, you know, 46 million, you've got these properties, there's this tipping point now, you've got all this momentum, and now you're, you're doing the teaching and the coaching. Can you kind of dive into why? Because you could just retire in Hawaii and, and stop. What's, what, uh, what drives you? Yeah, no, I love that. I love that question because it's a question that um, I get a decent, a little bit amount, but a lot of people comment, oh, you're fake because you wouldn't be on TikTok or Instagram if you actually had that real estate. So um, like I'm not comparing myself to these people, but like Elon Musk is worth $300 billion and he works 80 hours a week. So it, there's a certain point where it's not just about the money. And I think I want to continually prove myself to the, the, the students and, and the people we have in our community, because so many people get into real estate, they make their money, then they get into coaching and coaching margins are better. There's less risk. And then they forget about real estate. So I am not that I'm a real estate investor through and through. I own 47 million. I want to own a billion. Um, but my house buying company buys 250 houses a year. I want that to be, you know, a house buying company that buys 500 houses a year. So I'm looking to grow at scale in every aspect of real estate. And I'm going to coach along the way. So that makes it a little bit different. But in general, I just want to create more impact. I want to, I'm driven by creating impact, obviously upgrading my lifestyle as part of that. But in general, I still live very well below my means. It's not just about the money. It is truly about the impact, providing solutions, challenging myself, struggling, starting a new business, offering a new program, seeing it not work, figuring out how to make it work. It's about just creating more impact and money, of course, is a part of that. But there's a lot of other things that come along with impact. Like I have 16, and we're not going to make this a pitch, but I have 1,600 students now that own over $200 million in real estate. That's really, really cool. And I have students that buy 40 rentals in their first, uh, then the first year and quit their jobs. And it's really cool to see that stuff. And if I can help people and I'm not like a saint make money while I'm doing it, like that's addicting. That's more addicting than, you know, having, I got Tito's bottle over here, but grabbing some Tito's to do whatever. That's so more, <laughs> much more addicting to make money and change people's lives at the same time. It's really, really cool. Uh, and it's almost like the more I focus on changing lives, the more money I make. If I focus on money, that helps. But if I just focus on changing people's lives and providing solutions, the money comes in tenfold as opposed to me just focusing on money. So it's almost like the more I don't worry about money and worry about helping, the more money actually comes into play, which is kind of a backwards way to look at it. Most people won't because they, they don't see that there's actually a correlation, but there is. I, for most people, there is. 100%. You know, I have a lot of friends in different cultures that believe if you don't give back, you're not going to be successful. So there is something to that 100%. So single piece of advice that you would give to somebody listening here who wants to get started, what would it be? The main one would be um, you need to seek out, uh, you need to seek out failure. Because if you avoid failure, you avoid success. Like failure is literally on the stepping stone path to success. If you avoid failure, you avoid success. And that's where most people are. You're going to fail and you're going to fail a lot. And if you're going to be successful, you're going to fail even more. The most successful people you know have failed. Elon Musk has probably failed more times than he can count in that computer freaking AI brain that he has. Like the more successful you are, that means you have failed over and over again. The only way to get to success is failing and learning from your mistakes. Now, you can curb that by following somebody else's path for free on social media or paying a coach or mentor. But in general, you still have to fail. So I just want people to understand that. And if you have the expectation that you're going to fail, when you do fail, it's a lot easier to get back up. When you fail and you're blindsided, that's tough to get up, right? Just like in Sucker Punch. But if you're boxing somebody and facing them and you get hit, you know it's coming. It's pretty easy to get up or try to, try to figure out how to make it work. So I think the biggest thing I want people to take away from this is just start to get comfortable with failure. And I'm not talking leverage your house to the third degree and your wife's salary and the, whatever that like, I'm not saying do stupid stuff, but just be comfortable with the fact that failure is a part of your path. And I think having that expectation will allow you to move a lot quicker. No, I... I think when we look at 
we talk about finish line and start lines, right? You know that I think there's a saying there that you don't know how far you've gone until you turn around and look at the start line. I would say the same thing is with success because how do you know you're successful unless your baseline is failure? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just kind of existing. So you need failure in order to know that you've achieved success, if you want to put it a different way. A hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. Okay. So let's wrap it up with a question that I ask every single guest that I have. And that is, this is the Investing to Win podcast. We're talking about success here. So it's kind of funny. Good segue. How do you define success and what does winning look like for you? I love this because I just am completely changing my entire like, um, like motto and like vision for faster freedom, my online brand. And it is, uh, it is to inspire people to think differently about freedom. And you can put in success there as well, because people think of freedom differently. I want people to think of it this way, which is how I define success. And that is freedom. It's freedom of time. It's freedom of choice. It's being able to do what you want. It's living that both and life. Not that either or I can either get a new car or redo the kitchen. I can either do this or either do that. Success to me and winning to me is being able to do what you want when you want. It's not necessarily about having the biggest house or the biggest boat, but it's about spending time with your kids one you, when you want to spend time with your kids. It's about taking a break from your kids and going on a golf trip with your buddies when you want to do that. So it's about not letting your desires be decided by your bank account and let your desires be by the be decided by your desires, I guess is the best way to put it. Love it. Well, Sam, uh, like I said, uh, an hour has flown by here. Honored again that uh, you chose to spend some time with me and hang out here. And I think our listeners are going to get a lot out of this. We covered a lot of stuff. You could see me writing uh, notes here because uh, that's part of my ulterior motive is having guests like you on here because I'm still learning. Uh, so thank you very, very much for coming. I, I appreciate you having me and uh, hopefully everybody got a little bit out of it. I hope you enjoyed the episode today on the Investing to Win podcast. Make sure to hit subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to this on. If this episode made you think of another investor, take a screenshot and share this podcast episode with them. Investing to Win is not only about helping you to win more, but win actually stands for wise. Investors, network. It's where we help our investors build a hands-off portfolio and have passive investments work for them. To see how you can potentially partner with us, go to www.wongcapitalcorp.com forward slash invest to book a time to speak with Garrett and his team to see if there's a fit. Once again, the link is www.wongcapitalcorp.com forward slash invest. All links can be found in the description below. Until next time.